Right before we jump into this video, if you would like to take better pictures in only 11 days, I created a free mini video course that you can sign up for right now at fronosphoto.com slash 11 days. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a real world review of Nikon's IAF. Now they just put out firmware for the Z6 and the Z7, and we had an exclusive week head start to play with the Nikon Z6 with the new firmware to test out IAF. Now my friend Allison, she needed some graduation photos from college, so we brought her over here to do some grad photos, as well as she's a great model, so she was perfect to test out IAF because she has these big, beautiful, awesome eyes that are great for testing out. Later on in this video, we're gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison between three mirrorless cameras, the a7 III, the Z6, as well as the EOS R, where you see it locked off on a tripod using 70 to 200 2.8s with Atomoses on top, recording our EVF, so you see exactly what you would see if you were shooting photos. Now before we get into the shooting, let's talk about how you install the firmware, because it's super easy for Nikon, where it's not actually easy for Sony. Sony's is an absolute pain in the ass. For the Nikon, you download the firmware, you put it on the memory card, you put it in the camera, and you're basically ready to install it, and it's easy. Now, how do you set it up? You go into the custom setting menu, you look for A4, which enables the eye detection setting. Then you have to turn on auto area AF, meaning the camera's gonna do all the work for you in terms of focus. That's like full-time autofocus. You have no access to any of your focusing points to make changes. I ended up putting it in my eye menu so that I could quickly get to it, but it's not as fast as Sony where you just press a button and it's active. Or even when it's active, you can still move focusing points to make it reacquire. Now, it doesn't work for video, but it does work for stills. Let's move on to the real world shooting. What I wanted to do was hand hold these cameras and shoot it as if I was actually doing a portrait session so that I could get a feel, a real world feel, for how the IAF works on all three of these cameras. Now, it was an overcast sky and it was drizzling just a little bit, but honestly, God soft box up above is the best time to shoot portraits outside because it's even lighting. Especially when you're doing comparisons, you want even lighting that isn't going to change. So the first thing that I did is I started off with the Sony a7 III with the 70-200 2.8 to do some portraits. And the first portrait just looks great. The IAF finds the eye every time with the Sony and stays on it. The IAF hit exactly where it needed to hit. It allowed me to get the composition the way I wanted to get the composition. The next photo is a Sony again. It just finds the eye. Even if I stepped all the way back and did full frame and filled the frame with her, it's always going to lock in on the eye. You'll see that in the real world later with the comparisons when we're recording the EVF. Now, we also tested her walking towards me to see how the focus tracking would do. And with the Sony as expected, it did really well. It didn't really miss. She walked as if she was just walking, not, not too fast, not too slow, and it did a good job. This is more of the real world test. Like I said, I wanted to get a feel for how these cameras do in my hands and not just locked off on a tripod doing just straight up super technical tests. I wanted to feel it and see how it would do. Then I switched on over to the Canon with the adapted 70 to 200 2.8 on the EOS R and it worked. So this is the first time that I used IAF on the EOS R and it was one of the slower moving boxes. You'll see the overlay later and how slow it moves, but it, it hit the eye. It actually more hit the face because it didn't really find the eye until she got super close, but it looked good. And when she was walking towards me in the tests, it missed along, more so at the end. One of the last two shots is when it started missing a little bit of the focus, but it did fine tracking her. Would I trust it in an extreme action environment? No, that's what the Sonys are for. Let me jump in here real quick and say that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking for the best solution for building your online portfolio, use what I use for jaredpolen.com. Get a 14-day free trial at squarespace.com slash photo. And if you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now let's jump back into the video. But moving on to the Nikon, the IAF was good. Like, I was surprised. I didn't expect it to be, I thought it was gonna suck. 
To be honest with you, I thought it was going to be some childish attempt at doing IAF. It gets nowhere as close as Sony, so don't try to sit there and think that it's going to match the Sony today. It, it doesn't do it yet, but it finds the eyes. When I can select between the left eye or the right eye by moving the D-pad between left and right, that's a great function except for the fact that when you go vertical, it's kind of difficult to pick up the camera and then get to that D-pad with your thumb to try and move it because you don't have a vertical grip, Nikon. So it doesn't work as well there because I can't do it. Because it's vertical. But you can at least select the eyes, whereas with the Sony, you don't have the choice. You have to kind of like jerk the camera around to try to get it to switch from one eye to the other. So how the Nikon do in the walking tests? It tracked. It tracked the subject, found her face, found her eye as she was walking towards me. I kept shooting and it did a pretty good job. It, it didn't really miss. So in that situation, it did better than I expected. But I really wanted to go into the real world and not just test the 70 to 200, but use the 105-14 at 1.4 to do portraits, as well as break out the new 24-70 2.8Z and the 51.8S lens to see how they handled with IAF. There's one thing I needed to tell you about the 70-200 for the Nikon, is that it sounds like the gears are grinding. The autofocus gears sound like they're grinding. You can audibly hear it and feel it when your hand is up to the lens. You can feel the motors moving and you can also hear them. Whereas with the Sony, you don't hear that and you can barely tell that it's focusing because it's just so lightning fast. And with the Canon, which is adapted as well, you don't hear anything and you don't feel anything. It just focuses. So this is something just with the Nikon that we noticed. Now, Nikon and Canon will have 70 to 200 2.8 native lenses out sometime in 2019. Now that should make a difference in focusing speed, I think. Even though the companies tell you that when you adapt the lenses, there's really no difference, I think there's a difference. So I wanted a slightly different background, so we moved across the street. I love using the 105-14 for portraits, and being that we now have IAF in the Nikon, I wanted to test it out. And guess what it's perfect at? Eyelash AF. That's right, for a bunch of the shots, it was really good at finding the eyelash. Now, why could it find the eyelashes so well? Look at the size of the box. The focus box is so damn large. It covers the whole eye and then some. So what is the camera actually looking at? So it has trouble when you fill the frame with the 105-14, locking in on the eye that you really want in focus. Eyelash, sure. So how did I get around this? I switched into single point continuous AF. Now that's not AFS, it's single point, so one box in continuous focus. I move the box over to her eye and bam, nailed the eye time and time again. Now that's interesting because even on my D5, I had trouble getting perfect focus at 1.4. It was always off by a little bit. Now, when I took a step back with the 105 1.4, shooting at 1.4, going vertical, the eye looks fine to me. Because I guess, because you're further away, you can't really tell as much if it is out. Because now the box is a little smaller around the eye because you're further away, and it hit it where it needed to hit. One of the things I noticed was something I call ping-ponging. Yep, ping-ponging between the left eye and the right eye. I'm not hitting the button to make it move. I'm not hitting the D-pad to go back and forth between the eyes because it just was kind of annoying. What's happening is that the IAF must see that one eye is closer than the other, or maybe they're on the same plane, and it doesn't know where to stick, so it just keeps going boing, 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 back and forth, which is distracting when I'm trying to shoot. It would be nice if I could just be like, stay on this eye, and then override it by pressing the center button, then moving it, and then maybe that would be a little better. Now the next photo we're looking at is a vertical portrait with the 105-14 at 1.4. This is a type of portrait that I love to do when I'm doing my six degrees of photography. I want to just fill the frame with the face and get those eyes nice and big and try to nail focus on the eye. And in this case, it went back to eyelash AF 
again. Now I did use this camera for quite a while testing out the IAF, and we're just showing you a cross section of these images right now, so you can get my personal feel for it, and you can see the images and the EVF, and then we can get to the all important comparison videos where we put everything side by side, because that's coming up, and those are really good. Now back into this image, we know that it hit the eyelash. Now in order for me to switch out of the IAF, I have to hit the info button, I then have to then switch into single point to then get out of the info section to then start shooting the eye and move the focusing point to where I need it. The Sony, in most cases, if you fill the frame, it doesn't find the eye either as you get closer, but what it does allow you to do is override the IAF, move the focusing points that are still active, put that right on the eye, even though it's a grayed out box that Sony needs to change to make a different color one day like Nikon and Canon have done, but you can still move them independently and hit your focus. Next, I wanted to use the 24 to 70 2.8Z because that is the first professional lens, yes, professional lens for the Z6 and the Z7, and I loved it for IAF. So in this scene, it's kind of one of those hero type shots. You just graduated, congratulations. Now of course the car in the background and the, and the, and the brick building and, and the houses don't really mean anything, but for test purposes, it all lines up really well. So when I'm standing there with the 24 to 70 at 24 millimeters, the IAF goes right to her eye. And what that means is I can now move my composition because as I'm moving the camera, it's staying fixed on the eye. Now this isn't revolutionary because Sony's been doing this for a while, but for the Nikons, it's revolutionary. To be able to do this, and I'm just moving from picture, one picture to the next picture, to the next picture, to the next picture, I'm moving me. She's staying in the same spot. I don't have to lock in, focus, recompose. I don't have to chase focusing points by moving them and missing shots because I'm taking time to move it over to the right hand side of the frame. I'm allowing the camera to lock in on the eye and I'm just getting my composition and now just shooting and I don't have to worry about the focusing points. Another thing I noticed with the Z lens, silent and no grinding gears. So if that's a sign of what's to come with future Z lenses, that means that grinding of just the 70 to 200 is something that we will see in just the F mount lens. Now for the last independent test, I threw on the 51.8 because that's an S lens, it's native. And I did run into a little bit of eyelash AF with that, but I also love the framing and composition I was able to get and switching into single point I was still able to nail the focus where I wanted to, but I couldn't rely on just the IAF in this situation. As I, as I realized when you get closer, shooting at 1.8, shooting at 1.4, it's finding the eyelash, the nose, the eyebrow. It's not perfect and I can't rely on that full time. So if I'm just shooting a portrait of somebody, I'm probably going into the single point when I'm using a longer lens and filling the frame. When I'm shooting wider, I have no problem activating the IAF and allowing that to find the eye, especially at 2.8. Are you looking to speed up your raw editing or have a great starting point for your raw files? Well, we created 14 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out at fronosphoto.com presets. Over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and afters, and you'll also notice that they are 40% off. So if you like them, be sure to pick them up right now while they are still on sale. Now this is what you've all been waiting for, the side by side by side, because there's three cameras that we're comparing IAF. We've got the Sony a7 III with the 70 to 200 2.8 G Master lens, which is a native lens for this camera. We've got the Nikon Z6 with an adapted 70 to 200 2.8 FL, which is the latest version of their 70 to 200 2.8. And finally, we have the EOS R with an adapted 70 to 200 2.8 version 3 IS lens. Now to make this even cooler, we put Atomoses on top of each one of these cameras. So we stayed in picture mode. So what you are seeing through the EVF is exactly what you would see if you were putting your eye up to it and shooting photos. You will see the boxes move. You will see the focus hit, not hit. You're seeing exactly what you would be seeing if still photos were about to be taken. You will notice in the center that the Nikon Z6 viewfinder looks a little more contrasty and pumped up 
That's because I had my picture style pumped up because I like to see it a little more crunchy and contrasty in the camera. And the other ones are just on standard picture profiles. I didn't pump those up at all. So let's take a look here at Allison walking. Look, the Sony picks up the eye right away, whereas it takes the Nikon and the Canon, well, it took the Canon much longer to acquire the eye. And you can see that they're all doing a fine job tracking her as she's walking towards the camera. Moving on to the next test, we've got her spinning around and rotating, and the Sony just locks onto the eye and just stays there. And when her head turns all the way around, it becomes a bigger box and it finds her. The Nikon, you can see, hunts around every once in a while and finds her jacket, uh, finds her, her, her yellow shirt. And every once in a while, you see the, the red box show up, which is like it hunting all the way around. Now, you'll notice with the Canon that it's a little slower to acquire the face. Now, that's just the overlay. Is that because that the Nikon and the Canon don't have enough horsepower or power in the cameras to process this overlay because it was an afterthought to add with a firmware update, whereas the Sony may have more horsepower and it can just track the eye better and just lock on and the overlay is exactly where it is? What you'll notice is that even though the box may be slower to move, it's still focused. It's not exactly missing the focus, it's just that the box is lagging behind. Now we used one of the best models ever, me. I'm full in the frame here, and you can see that the eye is, it's, they're all locked on. Sony's is again smaller. Uh, Nikon's is bouncing around to my hair a little bit, but you can see that everything stays in focus. The Canon's doing okay, the Nikon's doing okay. Uh, the Sony, as we know, is really damn good. Wobbling back and forth. It stays locked on, it finds it. The, uh, the Canon looks like it's, it's hunting a little bit, but as I leave the frame and come back in, they all acquire the focus. Oops, we just lost the Canon. It lost it on the background, but then it came back and it found it before it lost it again. Uh, so the Canon failed just a little bit on that bad boy, and the other ones did a pretty good job. But they all show here from this example that they all are pretty good. Now, if you're seeing something that I'm not saying in these tests, feel free to put it in the comments below because sometimes we may not just see it and you may find something that nobody else noticed and just let us know down below and we'll take a look to check it out. Now for the next video, we have me leaving the frame, jumping back into the frame, leaving the frame, and we've seen that with the Sony, with the 135, 1.8, doing the kettlebell swings at 1.8, did a fantastic job tracking that subject. Now, how's, that was with the A9. How's it going to do with the A7 III compared to the Nikon and the Canon? Let's take a look. It's in a book. It's reading rainbow. Out of the frame, oops, Nikon. Nikon found the tree in the background. That's not a good thing. And every time you see it blink, the, the red blinking, that's when you're pressing the shutter button halfway down trying to reacquire it. It never reacquired. In order to reacquire it, we had to get out of that full-time autofocusing mode, like go into single point AF and then go back in, and then it could reacquire focus. With the Sony, you always have the points active that you can just move them around to reacquire if you lose it. Because what we can notice is that every once in a while the Sony will back focus, but then reacquire the subject as soon as it comes back into the frame. It is blazingly lightning fast. It just did it right there. It left, it hit the background, then it finds me. The Canon's super interesting because when I was bouncing in and out of the frame, it just stayed there. Even when I wasn't in the frame, it didn't back focus. So it was more sticky and knew that, well, he's bouncing in and out of the frame, that it should just lock on. So we decided to try the test again to see if the Nikon could do better. And guess what the Nikon did? Mm, not good, because it found that tree again. It's like, hi, look, a tree. Whereas you can see I'm waving and spinning and the other two cameras have it locked right on where it needs to be. So the Nikon didn't do good or do well in that particular situation. Next up, we have Allison walking towards the camera as well as spinning. We can see that the Sony, oh geez, the Sony just nails it. The Canon's doing a pretty good job of bouncing around. And the Nikon, for the most part, it's going right to the eye and occasionally it found her shoulder, but it was still in focus. Um, same thing, it's bouncing around to her neckline, not really finding the eye until she gets much closer and it actually barely found it on that clip, uh, and we know that the Sony's just great. The Sony, 
loses and reacquires and just stays sticky. So you can see that from time to time, the Nikon's hitting the shoulder, the Canon's just lagging behind, but you can see from the EVF footage that even though the box is lagging behind, it's still focused where it needed to be focused. One of the hardest tests for cameras is somebody running straight at the camera and hoping that its focus is spot on. So in this case, I run right towards the camera. Ooh, look at that guy run, he's so good at that. Sony, perfect. Nikon is basically perfect. And the Canon did a great job as well. Now we've got Dan walking towards the camera and you can see that the Nikon was hunting on the background. I just paused it here real quick because it was hunting on the background. You could see the red boxes moving. Then we stop it right here. We've got IAF for the Sony is right on the eye. The Nikon is finding the face and the Canon is also finding the face. It comes in closer and now we can stop it. We can see that the Nikon and the Sony found the eye and Canon is still on the face. Now the Canon lags behind just a little bit, but again, it's still in focus. Another tough test is Dan on a bike riding right towards the camera. Canon acquires it, Sony acquires it, Nikon is still hunting around the background until he gets much closer. And then even when he gets closer, you can see that it took it an extra couple of frames to get him in focus. The box was where it needed to be, but the focus was lagging behind just a little bit. The Canon actually surprised me and followed him basically the whole time. And the Sony, well, we know the Sony is always good, so it, it, it was perfectly fine. Now we try that test again, same thing. Nikon's hunting on the background till he comes straight at the camera and it acquired. So it just seems like the Nikon has more trouble when the subject is smaller in the frame until they get much larger and closer. But the Canon can acquire it, and the Sony definitely acquires it. And for the final test, we have me basically using my hands in front of my face to see if it tricks the autofocus. And you can see that it finds the hands, then it finds the face. It finds the hands, and then it finds the face. And as I leave the frame this time, the Canon is lost on the background, but then it reacquires. So it did a good job of losing it, but then finding it again. And with peekaboo, they all find my hands, then they find my face and my eye again. When, when you're close and you find the IAF, these things did a great job. So they all did a great job in that test. So that was an extensive look at how IAF works and not just the Nikons, but when you compare it to the Canon and the Sonys that are on the market right now. I didn't think that the Nikon would be good. I know I wanted to say like really good, but it, it's not really good yet. In certain situations, it's better. With the 24 to 70 2.8 Z lens, it worked fantastic for what I was looking for it to do. Now, I look at it as if the Nikon is a newborn or it's still in the womb because they're still trying to figure this out. Whereas the Sony is kind of already in college. It's getting ready to graduate from college because it just keeps getting better. Maybe it's going for its master's degree before it then goes for its doctorate. But it, it, the Sony is by far better. The Nikon, it's there. It's starting to be usable. And it's also starting to make me think that AFS mode is obsolete especially when you're shooting people or you're doing portraits, because why would we lock in and then recompose when it can just find the eye, which most of the time is where you want to focus. Of course, for landscapes and still lifes, it's a different story altogether, but for what I shoot, for shooting people and photojournalistic style work, I want the focus to find that eye, and nine out of 10 times, it's doing a fantastic job of finding the eye that I wanna focus on. Another quick observation, being that I used all three of these cameras within five to 10 minutes of each other is that I really loved the EVF on the Nikon. I love the colors and the contrast that I pulled out of that camera. But if I was to take three images, one from each of the cameras, mix them up after being edited, I probably couldn't tell you the difference between all three. So all three of them are fantastic at capturing sharp, contrasty, colorful images, especially when you shoot raw and you process the files. And one thing that's become abundantly clear is that I am relying more and more on this face detect and IAF, especially when I use the Sony cameras and now with the Nikon. Now, some people might say, but aren't you afraid that it's going to misfocus and you're gonna miss the shot? 
I look at it the other way. How many times have I been, for example, when I was on the Bedia photo shoot at his new restaurant, there were times where he was coming through the frame and I'm trying to move my focusing points to get the shot and I never could get the shot off because the focus point never was where it needed to be. I'm sitting there trying to move it and by the time I get it to where it needs to be, he's already gone. But when you have IAF activated, it finds the eye, it finds the face, and you can just react and shoot. Now, th the point I'm trying to make here is that I'm going to capture more images by allowing the cameras that are getting smarter and smarter to find the focusing points on the eye and the face rather than moving the points myself. I will miss less shots, I will react quicker, and occasionally I think that the IAF and the face detect will miss. But I think I will get more keeper shots by allowing it to do its thing than worrying about the very few that I'm actually going to miss. Since we're talking about a lot of different camera gear, if you're looking to pick up new gear or used gear, head on over to adorama.com fro, because when you use that link, it helps us to continue to make videos like these. Now at the end of the day, because this is a real world review of the new firmware in the Z6, how did it do? It did pretty good. It is a definite starting point. It's further along than I expected it to be. I thought that it wouldn't be able to track a subject. It, the Nikon did better than the Canon, but not as good as the Sony by far. The Sony is the best. But if you're a Nikon shooter and you've been waiting to have IAF, this is a start. It's, it's there. And in a lot of situations, it's going to work well. In some situations, it may lag behind, but it's a starting point. So the future is looking pretty bright on the Nikon side for IAF. Maybe future cameras that are coming down the line for the Z system, the pro ones, will be much quicker with the overlay and quicker with the IAF. We know they're behind Sony. Sony is well far in advance as they're already in college and Nikon and Canon, they're still in the womb or just about to be born. It's a good starting point. It's close. So that's it guys. What do you think about the test? Leave some comments down below. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And that is where I'm gonna leave it. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.